This is Jeff Baraka for Planet Boom. This is part three of a three-part conversation with music genius Thomas Dolby. We caught up with him on a fall day in Chicago during the North American leg of his Invisible Lighthouse tour. Here in part three, we continue to talk about his relationship with science and technology. I mean, your entire career rests at the, at the intersection of, of music and art and technology and imagination. Uh, talk about some of your, um, some of your real scientific associations that have developed as a result of you always kind of being on the, on the leading edge. Now talk about how, you know, as an artist, you, you are, you're a real science guy and you have these associations now that have developed out of that other work that you do. Well, I'm a dabbler, really, you know. I've, I never had the patience to be very scientific or mathematical with the uh, you know, the research that I do, the numbers I do. Sure. Really, it's all an excuse to, to express myself creatively. That's really cool. Though. But I've been fascinated, you know, I've always been fascinated with technology, not only current technology, but also past technologies sure. when things turn out differently. A lot of my stuff deals with sort of parallel worlds, you know, what if. Uh, what if the Nazis had invaded? In Alternate realities and such. Yeah. Okay. Um, you what, must like yeah. Doctor Who. Oh yeah. Totally. Okay. Yeah. Um, what if the microchip had never been invented and everything was powered by clockwork and steam? You know. Uh, so I often deal with these what if situations. Uh, what if I was a ham radio operator working with the underground resistance against the oppressor? You know. Wow. Um, so you know, I often think through scenarios like that in my songs, and so my relationship with science is really as an enabling one. Sure. Um, I like scientists. I spent 12 years as musical director at the TED conference. Uh, and, yeah, and, and right. Met Wanted some, to get to that. I met some amazing people there, sure. obviously, you know. Um, but my job there was to sprinkle fairy dust on the whole thing, you know. I was the music director. I brought in artists like uh, Paul Simon or, or uh, Peter Gabriel or Tracy Chapman um, to play little bits of snaps of music in between these amazing TED Talks gotcha. to help people sort of process all of the uh, migraine-inducing ideas that they were hearing. And uh, so, you know, I like hanging out with scientists. At the Smithsonian, uh, I got to share the stage with many local um, scientific figures, including Buzz Aldrin. Buzz Aldrin uh, really. And he actually came on stage with me to perform Shubhra Science. That's which so is cool, a, Which man. is a hoot. That is so cool. Um, my might um, Invisible Lighthouse premiere at, at a TED conference? I know TED is moving to Vancouver in March. Are you still going to be a part of that even though you're not the musical director anymore? I retired from TED about a year ago. I mean, they, they, I'm still you know associated with them and there's, there's uh, all sorts of TED activities going on. I really don't know uh, where the Invisible Lighthouse is going to premiere per se. For now, the only place to see it is if you come out on tour sure. and see it live in, in theaters and cinemas, at film festivals and so on. Uh, I, I want to end with, uh, man, your boat, your, your studio, the, the nutmeg of consolation. Mm. First of all, mm. I'm, I'm only aware of the, the word nutmeg as a spice. All so right. what does that phrasing even mean, nutmeg yeah. of consolation? I actually took the title from a naval fiction book called The Nutmeg of Consolation by Patrick O'Brien, who wrote Master and Commander. He wrote a lot of books about the, the British Navy at the time of Nelson and so on. Okay. And uh, my original plan with the boat was to sail around the world in it and sail up <laughs> rivers like the Thames and the Seine and the Hudson and do performances from the deck. Sure. But that would have actually taken, you know, a Larry Ellison sized wallet to pull off. <laughs> and so I settled to have a lifeboat in my garden with a studio on board, powered by the wind and the sun. That so, is so cool. So, so it's a solar powered yeah. and wind powered recording studio. Yeah. Come on, man. Um, you're so cutting edge with, with how you are blending the tech and the creativity. I know that um, in in, uh, in the Shoreditch area in London right now, there's this uh, tech startup community. They call it Tech City UK. Mm -hmm. Are you involved in, in any initiatives there? Are you working with any companies there? Or is your thing just off on your little, off on your coast? Well, I mean, the last time I was in Shoreditch, it was all, uh, you know, uh, curry restaurants and uh, the rag trade okay. uh, in, in Brick Lane. Um, so. It's changed a lot since then. Sure. Uh, it's great there's this sort of startup mentality now in the UK, because in the UK, as you know, for many years, people were resistant to the sort of entrepreneurial, you know, VC-funded um, to go that route. People are very protective about their ideas. Sure. 
And my company was in Silicon Valley where people are a lot more open and they would invite investment in. So I think that's changed a lot actually, you know, in, in the post uh, in the post dot com era. I think British people are much more open now to working with investors to incubate new tech projects, and I think that's a healthy thing. Gotcha. So you're you're back living in the UK now. You yeah. had been in you had been in uh, the US. You had lived in the US for a while. Um, there's a point in your movie where you where you say you've been around the globe, but there's always been something steering you back. And and what is that? I guess. I think what steers me back really is just the the connection, the strong connection I have with uh, with the place where I grew up. You know, sure. I think that's something you come to appreciate a little bit as you get older. There, there's a point in your movie where uh, you say um, it's hard to explain, but sometimes starting a new song can be like saving your own life. I, I may have messed it up a little bit. I'm paraphrasing. No, you got it exactly right. I really want you to, if you can, elaborate on that. I mean, we understand music and art can oftentimes, you know, be therapy and all, and all like that, but I really wanted to hear you elaborate on that particular line because it, it, it resonated with me. I tend to leave a mess behind me because I'm so driven creatively. Sure. You know, it's like I don't want to put any time into maintenance, into tidying up loose ends. Sure. So I, I tend to leave this sort of trail of havoc behind me. Okay. And very often when I start working on music, it's, it's well, you know, I've messed this up and I've messed that up. And uh, I'm just going to begin again with a blank canvas sure. and start a new song. So um, that's why it feels like saving my own life. Man, that's what's up. It's excellent talking okay. to you. I love the way you continue to reinvent yourself. Thank you. Thank you for hanging out with us. All right, Thomas Dolby, this is Jeff Baraka, Planet Boom. Yeah.